Hello. It's a pleasure to be here today in your beautiful city. It's raining a bit, but still, it's a pleasure to be here. Last evening, the festival sponsored a session called Big Ideas, Where Do They Come From? And as a society, we tend to focus on new ideas and the creation of knowledge. We celebrate this, we reward it. This afternoon, I'm going to focus on knowledge lost, on how once big ideas disappeared. A colleague and I have coined the term agnotology to describe the study of this phenomenon. This is our big idea. <laughs> and I hope that you'll be hearing a lot about agnotology in the next years. Agnotology serves as a counterweight for traditional concerns about epistemology. Agnotology refocuses questions about how we know to questions about what we do not know and why not. Knowledge is not pure, but like any cultural product, arises from and succumbs to deep cultural and political struggles. The knowledge I will be talking about this afternoon is women's knowledge of abortifacients. And not only have we lost the knowledge, but we nearly lost the word, the word abortifacient. When I started this project, I would say, I'm working on abortifacients, and people would say, what was that again? What exactly? Um, so abortifacients, for the most part, are herbal remedies that women ingest to induce abortion. Most work by inducing uterine contractions. Now this afternoon, I'm going to take you on a voyage. We're going to go halfway around the world and back 250 years in time. I think today the seas will be heavy. So prepare yourself. Let's board our sailing ship and head for the Caribbean where we will have three key destinations, and I wish we could really go. We would have planter's punch, a little rum. It would be a lovely day. We're going to go to Jamaica. Now, I don't think my laser pointer really... Well, anyway, you can see it there, Jamaica. We're going to go to Haiti, which in the 18th century was called Saint-Domingue, was a French territory. And we're going to Suriname, which is not on this map, but it's below, it's on... Um, the northern coast of South America, there below Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, it's on, you just can't see it. Yeah, it's there, you just can't see it, that's right. Now, in the 18th century, these territories were colonized by the Europeans, much like Australia would be later. Um, they, were, it, they were colonized by the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, and the English. The Europeans routed and out and killed the Indians felled the trees, and made these into very lucrative sugar islands. Sugar was big business in the 18th century. It was huge. This little tiny part of Haiti was a cash cow for the French. It was their most valuable overseas territory. The Europeans imported slaves from Africa to work the cane fields, and this is where our story begins. What I present to you today is not the story of a great man. I'm not going to talk about Joseph Banks or even Carl Linnaeus, whom I like to talk about. It is not a story of a great woman, though I might sneak that in somewhere, but it's the story of a great plant. The plant whose history provides the leitmotif for my remarks today is the Flos Pawanus, literally the peacock flower, this beautiful plant. The Latin is Poinciana pulcarima. Now, some of you may know it as the pride of Barbados. It's the official flower of Barbados. It's also called the Red Bird of Paradise. If you hail from the Malabar Coast in India, it's called the Tsideti Mandaru, though it has dozens of names specific to the cultures where it was used. And here you see the plant in situ. This is in Martinique, where I first saw the plant. And you see a rather studious historian of science, also in situ in Martinique, we historians must, in fact, go where we are called. Um, and I inclu I'm included here to give you a sense of the plant's size and proportion. The peacock flower is not a historic plant of the stature of chocolate, the potato, quinine, coffee tea, or even rhubarb. I would say that these plants have had their biographies written in recent years. I lavish attention on the peacock flower not because it's exquisitely beautiful, growing in stunningly inviting places, but because it's a highly political plant, deployed, as we shall see, in the struggle against slavery throughout the 18th century, 
used by slave women in the Caribbean islands who aborted their offspring so that they would not be born into bondage. How do we know this? The most remarkable information about the peacock flower comes from Maria Sibylla Marion's book where she recorded how the slaves and Indian women in Suriname used the seeds of this plant as an abortifacient. And this is her beautifully hand-colored, well, it was her beautifully hand-colored um, illustration. If you don't know Maria Sibylla Marion, you should. There's a new documentary film coming out on her. Um, and she is an exquisite artist, but she was also a scientist, and I'm interested in her here as a scientist. And here's what she wrote about this plant. She wrote, quote, the Indians and Africans who are not treated well by their Dutch masters use the seeds of this plant to abort their children so that their children will not become slaves like they are. They told me this themselves. Now, Marion's passage is remarkable for several reasons. First, it was written by a rarity. To my knowledge, Marion was the only European woman who voyaged in pursuit of her science in all of the 17th and 18th century. There were other women who voyaged and other women who were interested in science. Don't miss the fabulous Jean Barré, who was the first European woman to travel around the globe. In 1766, she sailed with Bougainville. But she did not go for her own scientific project. She went disguised as a male. No women were allowed on French ships overnight. She went disguised as a male, but in fact, she was the lover of the botanist on board, Philibert Commerson. They had had a child um, previous to the voyage together. Now, other women also voyaged, women like Anne um, Monson and Maria Riddle. They collected botanical specimens, but only as colonial wives or daughters, traveling where their families happened to take them, and not primarily for the purpose of pursuing their own scientific interests. So on now to Maria Sibylla Marion and bioprospecting in the Caribbean islands. Marion was indeed bold to travel to Suriname, then a Dutch colony, in 1699 at the age of 52 in search of exotic plants and insects. Moral and bodily imperative kept the vast majority of Europe's women closer to home. Medical doctors often warned that white women taken to warmer climes would succumb to copious menstruation, which almost always ends in fatal hemorrhages. Certainly not the stuff that gets you on the ship for a nice, you know, sail around the Caribbean. And as I crossed the equator on my way to your land, this passed through my mind, but in fact, I was fine. Despite warnings from the mayor of Amsterdam, who lost his four daughters in Suriname, Marion deposited her will and set sail for Suriname only a decade after upheavals in that colony left the governor dead, shot by his own soldiers. And so now we'll look to see where Suriname is. You can see these are all the botanical, European botanical explorers who fanned out around the world. Um, before 1732, and Marion was active there in Suriname, the northern part of South America. Maria Sibylla was accompanied by her daughter Dorothea, trained from an early age to work as her mother's assistant. For two years, mother and daughter collected, studied, and drew insects and plants of the region. Now, what I like about this is the example of a mother who trained her daughter in science. Marianne had two daughters. She didn't have any sons, so she didn't have an opportunity to train them, but she trained both of her daughters in her arts and in her science. Um, there's another German woman who did that as well in the 18th century. These German women were quite unique and interesting in doing that. Marianne was German and then moved to Amsterdam so that she could get in on the big voyaging that was happening in this period. Marion tells us that she learned about the abortive virtues of her peacock flower directly from the enslaved females of Suriname. Now, when I started this project, I assumed that abortion numbered among the many women's secrets in this period, and that male physicians and naturalists had only rudimentary knowledge of such things. So did only women know about abortifacients in the 18th century, 
was this women's knowledge? Well, yes and no. For over 2,000 years, women were in charge of birthing, birth control, and its attendant issues. Physicians knew how to perform abortions. They had to. Since Aristotle, European, European culture preferred the life of the mother when something was going wrong. But if a woman aborted without incident, physicians were rarely told anything about it. Women and their midwives handled birthing, miscarriages, and abortion on their own. But interestingly, Hans Sloan, here in full wig and regalia, who would become the future president of the Royal Society of London, worked as a young man in Jamaica a decade before Marion voyaged out to Suriname. And he also reported the abortive qualities of a plant he called the flower fence of Barbados. Later on, he realized this plant was the same as Marion's peacock flower and noted this in his book. Now, one reason I chose this particular plant for study is that naturalists from three separate European countries each independently discovered its use as an abortive in the Caribbean islands. This was a plant that was widely used and for centuries. Marian reported its use for this purpose as an abortifacient in Suriname. Hans Sloan reported it in Jamaica. And some time later, Michel Decortille, a French naturalist, observed the same use in Saint-Domingue, which we today call Haiti. Altogether, these naturalists identified a total of eight specific, land, excuse me, eight specific plants used for abortion in the Caribbean islands. Now, I'm sure there were many more than eight, but very often the reports of these plants will just be an herb. An herb was used, and we don't know what that might be. Now, we don't know who the women were who approached Sloan for an abortion. They might have been some of the fashionable free women of color shown here in this slide. Sloan did not discuss the ethnic or social status of the women he treated in Jamaica. He didn't tell us whether they were Eng English, Creole, or slave, for example. Hans Sloan, like many of the physicians of his day, was against abortion. It's because physicians did not actually handle these things, and whenever they saw a woman who needed an abortion or was in the midst of one, um, she was probably going to die, and that's why the physician was called. But physicians did know how to induce abortions, as I said earlier, and Sloan did not use or herbal abortifacients. <clears throat> as he wrote in his book, the method he preferred was the hand. Okay, he assumed everybody knew what this was. It took me about two years to find out what he was talking about. But quite literally, the physician used his hand. He would anoint it with some kind of oil, if he had it available, he would give the woman some opium, if not a little wine, and then he literally went in and pulled out the conceptus. Now let's look at abortion in the Caribbean islands. We know about the abortifacients, we know about the reports of the use of the peacock flower. To what extent was abortion practiced by the native and slave populations in the Caribbean? There's good evidence that the Indians in this area, the peoples called the Tainos, the Caribs, and Arawaks, made extensive use of abortive herbs long before European contact. And here we have um, a beautiful illustration of a, of a Carib woman. The Europeans really did not distinguish between the different Indian peoples in the 18th century, so we don't know if she was Carib, Taino, or Arawak, but Jean Le Pipe Le, uh, Baptiste Labat, who did this beautiful illustration in 1722, calls her the generic Carib. Now, we know that these women used abortifacients long before European contact. The first Spanish accounts from the New World described how Carib women aborted in the face of extreme circumstances. Las Casas in 1502 recorded the horrors of the Spanish cruelty, the fierce attack dogs, the swords used to disembowel or hack off women's breasts, and how this caused at least some Indian women to drown their infants or to, quote, take herbs to abort so that the fruit would be expelled stillborn. 
We actually know very little about how and why Native Americans developed abortive techniques. Alexander von Humboldt, who traveled um, into the interior of South America in the early part of the 19th century, was one of the first Europeans to encounter the peoples there. And he reported rather extensively on um, Native Americans and why Indian women practiced abortion. He noted that Indian women often wish it, wished to time their pregnancies precisely, some apparently thinking it best to preserve their freshness and beauty when young, and therefore to delay childbirth until later in life. Others preferred to become mothers when they were very young, thinking that this was the best way to fortify their health and attain a happier old age. When I was reading this, it reminded me of the debates we today have about, well, when exactly should I have a child? Because I have a career, I have to do all of these things, and um, what makes me healthier? So we get these very interesting reports. Now, most Amerindians in the Caribbean were free and did not live the life of slaves. But Africans in the Caribbean were slaves. There were 10 approximately, well, historians disagree about the number, but there were some 10 million Africans brought um, as slaves to the New World. And slave women practiced abortion, among other things, to resist slavery, as Marion told us. Though many women must have miscarried spontaneously as a result of hard work, poor food, and physical cruelty, slave women also induced abortion as a deliberate act of resistance to slavery. In an economy when planters or colonists sought to breed Negroes, as they were called, like horses and cattle, refusal to breed became a political act. Slave women's willingness to undergo the trials of abortion must be understood in this context. Slaves were the property of colonists, and slave women aborted to hurt the slave owner's property, to at least not create more. Abortion also resulted, though, from a sexual economy wherein slave women were used for European men's pleasures. Now, in addition to his flower fence, Hans Sloan highlighted a second abortifacian, Jamaican abortifacian, which he called the penguins. And he wrote about this plant. He said, he wrote in 1707, quote, it's very diuretic. It brings down the menses very powerfully. It causes abortion in women with child, of which whores, being not ignorant, make frequent use to make away with their children. You get these very strong statements in scientific books in the 18th century. It's really very interesting. Now, Janet Shaw, who was a Scotswoman who traveled with her kinfolk to Antigua, another island in the Caribbean, in the 1770s, similarly denounced the, quote, young black winches, who, in her words, quote, lay themselves out for their white lovers, and who, in order to prevent a child from interrupting their pleasures, had, quote, certain herbs and medicines that free them from their encumbrances. And, of course, the slave women she's talking about mostly had little choice in the matter. The Scottish mercenary John Steadman commented extensively, he was a lieutenant, a Scottish lieutenant who went, who served as a mercenary in Suriname and was employed to keep the many, many slaves there in check. He commented extensively on the commerce and sex required of young black and mulatto girls in Suriname. His diary ringing, perhaps with the vibrato of a young lieutenant, detailed the number of women offered to him. He was hardly off the boat from Amsterdam when, quote, a Negro woman offered me the use of her daughter while here for a certain sum. Now, this practice of Negro women, mostly it was the masters of the slave women, offering their slave to a European man while he was in the colonies was raised to a quasi-official institution known as the Suriname marriage. It was an arrangement by which a European man paid an agreed-upon price to a slave woman's master for her services while in residence in the colony. So she served as his housekeeper, she would serve as his cook, and um, take care of him when he was sick because she would most likely know about the um, herbal medicines of the region, and she also then performed sexual services. Stedman um, 
was part of one of these Suriname marriages, and he fell in love with the girl that he was with and planned to take her back with him to Europe as his Christian wife. Um, this was, the Dutch didn't actually allow this, I think the Scottish did, um, but she unfortunately died before he was leaving in any case, so we don't know what would have happened. Now, Stedman found the male planters. He had a lot of criticism of the male planters, the colonists that he worked for in Suriname. He found the European male planters dissolute, going to bed late and passing the night in the arms of one another of their slave women. Whether married to European or not, the masters often kept slave women for this purpose and offered them freely to male guests. And here you see this front figure is a man, you know, love the hat. Um, he's a male planter, and you see one of his girls in the background um, serving him a nice drink in the hot day. Now, it was not uncommon that when you... So it was hard to move around the col in the colonies at this time because you had a horse, you probably did not take your carriage because the roads were extremely poor. So if you went from one plantation and went all the way to a neighboring plantation to visit, you certainly stayed the night. And when these males visited each other and stayed the night, they were offered women um, for the night as well. well. Now what do we learn from this story? What happened to the peacock flower? and two abortifacients that were widely used in the Caribbean at this time. What happened to this plant, which was discovered by Marion in a Dutch context, by Hans Sloan in an English context, and by de Courtille in a French context? We must remember that Europeans in the 18th centuries were in the Caribbean bioprospecting. That is to say, they were looking for profitable plants and valuable medicines. We bioprospect all the time still. Um, many of our U.S. pharmaceuticals bioprospect in Costa Rica. We bioprospect in Mexico. People are looking for valuable plants. This was going on from as soon as Europeans left their own shores, the 15th century and onward. Now, normally, once something valuable was discovered, it was taken back to Europe, it was tested, and then commercialized. This was the trajectory for a number of American plants, quinine, jalap, ipecacuanha, sugar, and chocolate. You should know that sugar and chocolate were official drugs in the 18th century. If you need another reason to eat chocolate, you should know that it is actually good for you medicinally, except that the way that we um, process our chocolate takes out the parts that are actually good for you. So Hans Sloan was very clever. He was a physician and he took a lot of medicines from Jamaica and then prescribed them to his patients in London. So he had a supply coming to him all the time and prescribed them for use. He was the first um, who mixed milk with chocolate, bringing you milk chocolate. The Spanish, as you know, uh, ate chocolate with spices, um, but that was not palatable to the English tongue, and um, they prepared milk chocolate. So it was not unusual for valuable plants to be taken to Europe and brought into commerce. But not so for the peacock flower. It was reported on by European naturalists, and the plant itself was taken into the botanical gardens. It grew in Amsterdam, it grew in Leiden. We have reports of it growing in the Chelsea Physics Garden outside London. But the knowledge of the plant as an abortive did not flourish in Europe. Winds of prevailing opinion kept this valuable knowledge about women's anti-fertility agents from coming into Europe. This knowledge, which might have been enormously valuable to women, was ignored. It was suppressed, and it was finally forgotten. As such, it is a perfect example of agnotology, of how knowledge becomes entangled, how innocent plants really become entangled in larger political struggles, and how they can eventually disappear and even go underground. Thank you.